Dan and I to be here. We um, want to invite all of you back to California sometime if you ever want to warm up <laughs> or get cell phone service or anything like that. <laughs> if you've ever uh, sat through one of my classes, you know that I love a, uh, a good alliteration. Uh, I love making uh, lists of all the things that start with the same letter. And uh, when we think of judges, immediately I was tempted to uh, put together some good alliteration. Some of these things might uh, come to mind. You might uh, remember, maybe if you're like me, you're in Sunday school, you learned about the, uh, the sin cycle, how uh, Israel would sin and God would bring about suffering and they would raise their voices in supplication, and God would bring them salvation. You may have grown up maybe with a different alliteration. You may have heard about disobedience, followed by destruction, followed by desperation, and finally, deliverance. Or maybe your Sunday school might have used the letter R <laughs> with rebellion and retribution and repentance, and reform. Or, considering how this is Texas, you might have used the letter Y. <laughs> y'all sin, y'all are punished, y'all repent, y'all are forgiven. I think there's even a letter A as well, I'm not quite sure. But, um, I, I, I like them all. You know, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a very true and, and uh, helpful cycle for us to remember, and how it doesn't just apply to the people of Israel, it applies, it applies absolutely to us in our life, how we uh, get, get away from the Lord, and he, he brings about something in our life that brings us back, and then we got to start feeling good again, and we get away again, and he starts bringing us back. But this weekend, I'm not going to talk about the sin cycle. I'm going to talk about a completely different theme in the book of Judges. You see, I prefer to see the book of Judges as an amazing story of strength and weakness. When I, when I read through Judges, I see a wonderful lesson, an amazing lesson of God using some of the most unimpressive instruments to bring about his victory and ultimately his glory. Judges is not simply a story of man's weakness and God's deliverance, but it's a story of God's deliverance through man's weakness. We see that God specifically chooses some of the weakest, most flawed human beings to bring about great and miraculous victories. At first, you might think this is something unique and an interesting twist, not only the book of Judges, but the more you think about it, you realize that's simply not the case. That all through history, even today, God actually prefers to work in this way. He did this in the time of the Judges, and he did it all through the Bible, he does it in our lives. Not only am I encouraged by this, not only am I encouraged by seeing that God can work through men who are weak in faith. Men who, who make bad decisions in their life. Men who sin. Sin dramatically. But I'm also humbled by coming to realize that God almost exclusively does so. I've come to realize that I'm not that great. But God works in me, nonetheless. It's a principle that God speaks about quite clearly in the New Testament. Look what Paul writes to the Corinthians. First Corinthians, he says... For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise, according to worldly standards. 
Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Boy, he's really romancing them here, isn't he? But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Verse 28, God chose what is low and despised in the world. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. Why? Verse 29, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. It's a, it's a clear and simple principle when you kind of come to grasp it. God, does, God realizes that we have enough problem already with our pride. He doesn't want to give us something else. He doesn't want us to be able to boast in the great things we've done or said. He wants us to realize that it's him that's working. I think of Paul. I mean, Paul was spoken to directly by Jesus in heaven. I mean, this is the, this is the relationship Paul has. This is the, the level that Paul's working on. He's walking on the road and a blinding light comes and a voice speaks to him. Paul received amazing visions and revelations. He was, he was caught up into paradise. Paul heard things that cannot be told, that no man can utter. And look what he says. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But look what God says. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is perfected in your weakness. That's the lesson I want us to really take to heart this weekend. That's the lesson that God tried to teach Israel 1,500 years before Paul. It's the same lesson he wants us to learn today. So we'll go to the book of Judges with a critical eye. And we'll look at these men, these women, the lives that they led, the decisions they made. And we'll hopefully see that lesson. That God wants us to understand that His power is made perfect in weakness. So we'll start at chapter 1, Judges chapter 1. The whole story, I think, of the, of the times of the Judges is established here in verse 19. Judges 1.19. They came into the land to take possession of it. And we read, The Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain, because they had chariots of iron. What is that? Nine words? Nine words, and it establishes the next thousand years of their history of their struggle with the nations around them. You see, the Philistines had iron. And the Israelites were unable to drive them out. This inability to drive out the pagan nations from the land is a recurring theme in Judges. And it's the source of so many of their problems. As you go through, you read, the Canaanites were content to dwell in the land, verse 27. Verse 29, the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer, verse 30. The Canaanites dwelt among them, verse 32. 
The Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites. Verse 34, the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain. This uh, tolerance of the nations around them would be the downfall of Israel. And it's in complete opposition to what Moses told them to do in Deuteronomy. This mistake brings about their sin, and ultimately, it brings the wrath of God upon them. The Israelites were soon infected with the pagan outlook, the way of life of those around them, the worship of the other nations, Instead of the nations seeing the goodness of the Israelites and wanting to be converted to worshiping the true God, the Israelites went whoring after their gods. I would think that the other nations would have marveled. They would have sat back and just marveled at how quickly these Israelites would abandon their God and assimilate every idol that they came in contact with. All right. I feel pretty connected to that one. How are you faring in your relations with the nations around you? My son has a poster in his office. Ships sink, not by being in the water, but by the water being in them. <laughs> we have to live amongst the nations. We have to go to work, we have to go to school, we have to walk in our neighborhood filled with pagans, filled with heathens, people who make ungodly choices every day. Are we influenced by them, or are they influenced by us? You see, the thing that we tend to forget is that the Israelites could have been a positive influence on their neighbors. That's what God had intended. God had intended for them to be a light to the nations. He intended for them to show forth the greatness to all the nations of the world, and for the people to come to the Jews and to learn of God. He intended for them to preach by example, just like he intends us to do today. They were in the world with all the others, but by their exceptional behavior, they were supposed to influence those around them to come to God. How am I doing in that? same task. Is my exceptional, unique, rare, odd behavior influencing people to ask me about my God? Or am I acting just like them? That's what happened back then. The neighbors influenced them instead of they influenced the neighbors. Look at the, the second chapter, Judges 2. They abandoned the Lord. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they went after other gods. From among the gods of the people who were around them, and bowed down to them. And the result is obvious. They provoked the Lord to anger. When it says, Israel went whoring after other gods, it's not a figure of speech. The pagan worship of the nations around them actually involved sexual practices. So God punished them for their infidelity, literally for their infidelity. Now the tricky part is that God used the nations around Israel to bring about his punishment upon them. You often can't easily see God's hand at work in your life. God works through the people around us. He works through natural occurrences. He 
if you only look on the surface, you'll think it's bad luck. The Jews would have thought it was just the nations attacking them because they have iron and we don't have iron. It took them several years, every time, over and over again, several years, to realize that it was God punishing them. We tend to look at the surface level of our problems, not the spiritual lesson behind it. We get all caught up in the immediacy of what's going on, the urgency of the situation, and not back up and look about what's behind that problem. So people repented and they cried to God for help and God delivered them. Verse 16 tells us the Lord raised up judges <coughs> who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Judges aren't like what we think of when we think of judges. A guy sitting on a bench wearing a robe making decisions. And judges were not like kings either. They didn't pass laws. Every king that ever sat on the throne had the blood of David in their veins. The office of judge, it didn't pass from father to son. A judge rose up. Rose up amongst his brethren. Was respected. Was listened to. Judges had to stand based on their own knowledge and their own wisdom. Judges also differed from kings is that they could not command the loyalty of the people. They could only appeal to the people for their loyalty. If you've ever served on an arranging board, you know how much easier it would be to be king than recording brother. It would be so much easier just to be able to tell people what to do. Instead, we need to appeal to them, to encourage, to exhort, and to lead by examples. The judges are perfect examples for those of us trying to lead our ecclesias. You won't get very far in your ecclesia by trying to command your brothers and sisters to live godly lives. But you can lead a good example. And you can appeal to them to raise their standards, to try a little bit harder, to do a little bit better. But the people of Israel, they wouldn't learn, right? Look at the next verse. They did not listen to their judges, for they poured after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. What we'll see as we go through the Judges is when it says turned away from the way that their fathers walked, it's literally talking their fathers. One generation away. But thankfully, God's love and his compassion for us is greater than our wickedness. You might think your wickedness is pretty bad. You might be doing some things that others don't even know about, maybe your own spouse doesn't know about. And you might think you're pretty wicked. God's love for you is greater than that. God's compassion is greater than anything you could do. His perseverance to bless us is stronger than our persistence to sin. Look the next verse. Whenever the Lord I skipped the verse. Ooh, I skipped the whole thing. My bad. I skipped the verse on the slide, that's why. Uh, look at the next verse, verse 18, which isn't on the, on the screen, but verse 18 in your Bible. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. <laughs> For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But 
The limits of the Israelites' wickedness knew no end. Ever, you're familiar with the saying, out of sight, out of mind. I think one of the common problems we all face is how easily we forget. We do good when we're being constantly reminded to do so, but left on our own, we quickly slide back into our own habits. That's what happens in verse 19. Whenever the judge died, they turned back. And were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. They were more corrupt this, this sin cycle is not an even cycle. Every time this comes down, it goes lower than it was before. The next judge has an even harder time to cajole and, and inspire and motivate and appeal and encourage them to rise up again. And they would. They would come up and they'd be blessed by God. But as soon as that judge died, they turned back. And they were more corrupt than before. And God eventually gets tired of this, and he, he gives them up to the nations around him to live among the nations as a, as a test. And how does Israel respond to this test? Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 5. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. So it's at this point, Judges chapter 3, that we start to see the judges into the story. They're referred to as saviors. The Hebrew word for judge actually means more like deliverer. They weren't doing any judging more in the sense of how one's person, one person's righteous actions can convict everyone else in their evil actions. In that sense, they were judging. If someone is living righteously and you're living wickedly, then they judge you by their lifestyle. What you notice as you read the first few chapters of Judges is there stories of seven different oppressors and seven different deliverers. And this theme of strength and weakness is firmly established in these first few chapters. The really neat part is that in each one of these seven deliverances, we see God using some very unimpressive instruments to accomplish the deliverance. When we think of going into battle, when we think of, of beating or defeating a nation around us, the, the Hivites, the Paradites, the Amorites, you think of, you know, bulwarks and, uh, and horses and uh, uh, maybe large, uh, you know, weapons and, and iron and strong men and, and armor. And God uses an ox goad. God uses a tent peg. God uses a clay pot. A, a left-handed man. A woman. <laughs> he uses the piece of millstone. <coughs> he uses the jawbone of an ass. You see, the nations around Israel had the absolute latest in military weapon design. They had the strongest steel swords, the sharpest spears, the speediest chariots, and God uses a jawbone of an ass, a tent peg, a clay pot, a broken clay pot, to bring about victory. This weekend, I'm going to look at some of these examples. The first period of Israel's suffering comes about just like the rest. The next verse, verse 7. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asherah. And the result, just as you would expect, the next verse. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishim, 
king of Mesopotamia, and the people of Israel served him eight years. So after eight years of subjection, the people come to their senses, and we see in verse 9, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel, who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. We now see something happen to Othniel that happens to each one of the judges of Israel. And it's the key to their success. It's the key to the story. Look at verse 10. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. God only does not deliver Israel through the hand of men, but it's also not through man's hand that they're successfully governed or successfully led. God leads the people himself by imparting courage and wisdom and prowess to the judges. The judges are unique in that they're the kind of people who allow God to come into their heart so that God can work through them. Instead of thinking that they can do it themselves, instead of thinking that they have the capability, the capacity, the, the faith, the strength, they are open to their weakness. They're open to their frailty. And open and willing to let God work through them. Othniel leads Israel for 40 years, and for 40 years they have peace, and then Othniel dies, and guess what happens? The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And again, retribution for their actions comes upon them from God, this time through the Moabites, who were helped by the Amorites and the Amalekites. And for 18 years, the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of the Moabites. Finally, the people cry to the Lord, and he raises up a judge again. In verse 14, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. Why does it bother telling us he was a left-handed man? I don't want to offend anyone here that's a lefty, but in, in Jewish culture, the right hand is the hand of strength. The right hand is the hand of power. To sit upon the right hand is the position of authority. And God specifically calls out that Ehud is a left-handed man. Even though Ehud is going to use a sword to kill Eglon, he does it with his left hand. God is kind of telling us he brings about deliverance, even through a weak little lefty. <laughs> and Israel has peace. They have peace for 80 years. Let me see a few words about Shamgar. Literally, a few words. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anna, who killed 600 Philistines with an ox goat. And he also saved Israel. An ox goat? A, 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 a prod, a stick you would use to, to make a, a, an ox go along. Shamgar killed 600 of the Philistines. Was it Shamgar who was exceptionally strong? Was it an ox goat that was exceptionally sharp? I don't think so. The lesson we are trying to learn here is we have to open our hearts up to allow God to live in our lives. That God purposely chooses weak things to perform His glorious work. So don't worry if you don't think you're good enough. Don't worry if you don't think you're strong enough or, or smart enough. Because that kind of is the point. That's why God chose you. God simply wants you to be humble enough to let him use you 
in the way that he wants to. And it may not make sense. It may be illogical what he's chosen to do. But that's where the faith is required. Instead of thinking that you know the best way to go, trust in God to make that decision. Meanwhile, back in Israel, we come to chapter 4, and guess what? The people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The familiar apostasy brings about the familiar retribution, which brings about the familiar servitude. In Deborah, we see a different kind of deliverer. First of all, Deborah seems to have already been judging Israel at the time. And she was more of a judge, too. Look at verse 4. Deborah, prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel and the hill country of Ephraim. People of Israel came up to her for judgment. So God had raised up Deborah, but she doesn't deliver the people. She acts more like a judge, and she holds court. She holds court in the remote hill country of Ephraim, where the domination of the iron chariots wouldn't have been as severe. Her first job is to call Barak to rally the tribes of the north while she organized the tribes in the south. And we learn a lot about Barak by his response to her request. Look at verse 8. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. What's your first impression of Barak? If you're anything like me, you just kind of think of Barak as being weak, scared, unfaithful. Barak is unfaithful, says Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. What shall I say? For time of failure, you shall have Gideon and Barak. Hmm, I guess I better rethink my first impression of Barak. Barak is in the faith chapter. I think the lesson I need to learn is that God looks for something different in people than I look for. And I look for the, the, the big, strong, the, the incredibly intelligent, the, the, the born leader. Someone's going to stand up and say, I will do it. When Deborah calls him down and says, yes, I will go. I will slay these people. It's not what God looks for. God looks for people who possess the characteristics of a child. When you ask yourself, what is it that a child is like? You know, when Christ talks about children, what is it that, what we should be like? What, what characters in children should we be like? We often get answers to things like children are sinless, and, uh, children are innocent, and uh, children uh, obey what they're told. And uh, those things might be true, but another thing to think about is children have an utter lack of confidence in themselves. They're, they have an implicit confidence in their parent, in the father. And that's maybe part lesson that we're supposed to learn. Not to think that, oh, we can do this, we can handle this, I got this, no problem. But to realize that we need God to help us through all of our problems. When men choose a leader, they choose the big, strong man who literally stands, you know, ahead, above the rest. But God looks upon the heart. Perhaps if Barak's faith had been even stronger, he would have gone on his own. But maybe he would have failed. I like how Deborah replies in verse 9. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not be led to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Little does Barak know that Deborah is not even speaking of herself. 
Now, we know that the Israelites had no weapons to speak of. They weren't allowed to have iron. So with no chariots, the most primitive of weapons, and even a faith that didn't seem to be very strong, Barak still moves forward. Facing an incredibly strong army that's highly more equipped than you are, The only hope you have is your trust in God. The only hope you have is to believe in God's deliverance. In verse 14, it tells us, Deborah said to Barak, Up, ah, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Does not the Lord go out before you? What a great lesson that is. Has not the Lord gone before you, is what Deborah tells us. Don't, don't look in your life for God to back you up. Don't look for God to be behind you all the way. Don't look for God to support you or, or to fill in the gaps where you leave, leave, leave off. Because God goes ahead of you. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new thing for us to swallow. It's not that God is going to help us with our battles. It's that God wants to fight the battle for you. He wants you to be humble enough to allow that to happen. Trust that God is able to fight that battle for you. Look what Barak sees upon his arrival. The Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on Remember those chariots they were so terrified of? Sister was running away on foot. So, the tough question, why didn't God simply rout Sisera and all his chariots and army without Barak? If God can do this, if God wants to fight these battles for us, then why does he bother involving us? God is capable. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera. But there's something that God needs. Something that God wants. He wants our obedience. Our obedience unlocks God's power. If we don't move forward first in faith, then God does not respond. So it's a tricky thing here. I'm telling you that God wants to fight that battle for you. That you don't have to be the one to do it. But I'm also telling you that God wants you to take the first step. God wants you to move forward, to advance forward, and then he will rout the army for you. If we don't even attempt to advance on our own, even though we're greatly outnumbered and outgunned by the enemy, then God will not help us. That's the trickiest part. That first step in faith. That first step fully realizing and accepting the fact that it is impossible for me to accomplish what it is I want to accomplish. There is no physical way this can be done. This, this is not going to be successful without God. And still taking that first step forward. With God, the victory is complete. God doesn't do things half-heartedly. God doesn't just barely save you. God doesn't leave some people in the land to come back and, and trouble you later. Look at the next verse. Barak pursued the chariots and the army, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword, and not a man was left. That's how God delivers us. He does it completely. He does it beyond <coughs> our, our wildest imagination. You're facing this problem, and you're thinking... There's no way we can solve this. I only have 
uh, $12,000 and the problem is, is uh, $38,000. There's no way I can solve it. And when you trust in God and God comes and goes before you into that battle, you take that first step and you advance forward and open your heart up to God to fight that, He doesn't just bear it. He does it dramatically and fully. He also does it naturally. He does it through normal occurrences. That's why we often don't see it. People don't see it around us. Why we tend to take the glory for ourselves. Because you, you, you did this action here and, and this other thing happened. We see in the next chapter that God brings about this big storm and the rain causes the fields to fill up with deep mud. And what was the, what was the big fear? Those iron chariots. Those heavy iron chariots. And they get stuck in the mud. And they're sitting ducks for Barak and his men on foot. I, I like how Sisera abandons uh, the chariot and he runs away. The Sisera knows that there's a traitor who lives nearby. Sisera knows Heber, the Kenite. A Kenite is a smith. Hmm. An iron smith. Now, what do we know about Israel under the, the domination of the Canaanites? They weren't allowed any iron, right? And yet, Heber was an ironsmith. So, obviously, he had made some accommodations with the enemy, with the oppressor, with the heathen nation, to ensure the success of his business. And no matter how much of a traitor the husband was, that doesn't mean that the wife had to be unfaithful. Jael is faithful and obedient. She's patiently lived with Heber, observing his evil ways, and now she takes the opportunity to act, to do something that will redeem herself from the years of quiet inactivity. She's eaten the rewards, literally eaten the rewards of Heber's treachery, and now she's ready to spit it out and cleanse herself in her family's tent. So she takes action. She moves forward in faith, even though she's just a you know, in, in Bible times, a, a poor little weak, you know, woman. We never, we don't think of women like that today. We're much more advanced in our, our thought, right? But, you know, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't shirk away from that, thinking, oh, I can't do that. It's not, not my role. She moves forward in faith. And she does something that she surely didn't feel she was strong enough to do. But she did so knowing that God would be with her. She grasped the opportunity to correct her wrong and to clean her conscience and to clean her family name from her treacherous husband. You look at jail, and you've got to realize that no matter who you are, no matter what position you find yourself in, an alien, uh, a newly converted, or even a woman in, in a male-dominated country, you can have a great positive effect upon your brothers and sisters by serving the Lord with strong resolve and faith. By taking that step forward, knowing that God is going to be there to help you. No matter where you are in your life, no matter what mistakes you've made, you can move forward and you can take action in your service to God. So we're going to do this weekend. We're going to look at a few examples of people who allow God to work in their lives even though they were filled with fear. Even though they had made poor decisions in their life. And even though they committed great sins. God shows forth His strength and weakness. Maybe it was because they were fearful. Because they were sinners. Because they were people who constantly made stupid decisions. Maybe it's because they were people 
just like you and me, that God chose to work in their lives. You see, each one of us, we make choices every day in our lives. Choices that shape and define us. And the judges were humans. They were just like us. The judges had to make choices every day. And God chose to work within those frail, human, sinful people. And he will work within us as well. Today we're going to talk about fear. Making fearful choices. And how God is able to work in your life even if you're full of fear. We'll talk about how God can work with you even when you make really, really bad decisions. And tomorrow for Sunday School, one of the most important lessons for us to learn is that God chooses to work good through you, even when you sin.